Well, friends, fellow listeners, G-Rex and I, we like to think that we're pretty transparent, right, with our feelings and our emotions. And I think part of this is just sharing with everyone when we have wins and losses, loses, losses. 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 (laughs) I feel like losses is the right word. Um, But mostly we just, at least from my perspective, we want to just be completely transparent and honest with our listeners. And we would normally have a new episode to share with everyone. However, this week, this episode is a celebration of life. And um, in memory of Liz, AKA Bookie, she was so fabulous and we had so many amazing reviews of her episode and this was so so very hard so we found out that bookie passed away on july 8th um they had found that she had cancer in her spinal fluid and um it had metastasized to her brain and uh, the really sad part about this is i had just heard from her like a week ago and that she was in the hospital and she was bored and tired of watching reruns of Family Feud. And I had let her know that we had a new episode coming out with uh, Broadway, and she was super excited about that. And I I was just so filled with happiness when she agreed to come on the podcast. And we learned some incredible lessons from her. And if there's one thing that we can take away from her legacy is that Life is made of memories, and it's not about what we own, but it's about those memories that we make on a daily basis. And Bookie, Liz, this is for you, because I took those lessons that I learned from our podcast that we did with you, and we were taking life by the horns now. Um, You lived every day to the fullest, and for anyone that ever had a chance to meet her, work with her, uh, she was just a bundle of fun. And she made that podcast so much fun. We laughed so much during that. I'm I'm sure our producer, Bizzle, had to uh, take a few <laughs> parts out because um, we couldn't stop laughing. But um, such a hard, um, a hard week, hard weekend. And um, this is all for our friends and our family to, you know, share her love for life because she really knew how to live it. Yeah. She may be gone from our touch, but forever in our hearts. Amen. And in our ears. And our ears. Enjoy this re-release of our dear friend, Bookie. You know and our I, format, right? Like we I know your don't... format. I do know also that I'm, I'm, I tend to like either not drink it all or drink a lot, which is probably some something diagnosable. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you want to know, I haven't had a drink since we got back from the beach last month because, like, I'm, I'm like dry or drunk. I'm like, I have no in between. You should have a drink with us because we're both drinking. Well, no, I actually, we went to the beach for a week, a little over a week, and every day we had something to drink. Even if it's just like a glass of wine, every single day we drank. And I'm leaving on June 2nd to go to Edinburgh in Ireland, and I know I'll have a drink every day there. And since my liver has had radiation and had cancer in it, I try to like go through long dry spells before when I know I'm going to have go through long drink spells. So I'm on a dry spell right now. So um, what did you think of our last, our episode with Bookie? Um, I really loved the fact that she's out there living life, even though she's got a terminal um, diagnosis. She inspired me. She isn't letting what I would imagine break me, break her. She's out there. She's living life. She is taking it by the ball, so to speak, and making the best out of it and she's not letting anything hold her back no and i i just love that you know like we always talk about you know liberty and laughing about things and you know 
hindsight is twenty twenty, and just living her life. Like something that I think we could all learn for from, even though, you know, most of us don't have a terminal in- illness or a chronic illness, but just living your life. Yeah. And, and I, and I'm really taking away just that what makes life worth living is the experiences. And now live, love life with Bookie. Today we have a very special guest. Her name is Bookie, and she's going to talk to us about living with a terminal um, terminal illness. Fuck. Start over. Start over. <laughs> Take Start six. Over. <laughs> <laughs> Start over. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Shit That Goes On In Our Heads. This is episode... Fuck me. God damn it. Okay, I can't... I can't. <laughs> Take a sip. You know what? That must be a high pressure guest. I don't mean no. to put that much pressure on you. <laughs> it's just me. He could drink you under the table. It's sort of. Fucking jet lag is what it is. All right. Try this again. I'm going to close my eyes though. Okay. Three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Shit That Goes On in Our Heads. This is season two, episode four. And today we have a very special guest bookie and she's going to talk to us about living with a terminal illness and how she's going about her life i I, uh found out in 2016 i had breast cancer i did what every responsible person does i I, actually both my grandmothers have breast cancer i don't have the gene or any genes you know combination they've discovered yet but um i went ahead and opted for a radical bilateral mastectomy which means they take all your tissue all your genes they go all the way back to your chest while and a reconstruction called a deep flap which was quite fascinating they took the fat from my tummy and maybe some nice new top tails but um yeah it's pretty it's a fascinating thing because you kind of get a tummy tuck and new boobs all at once and even though you have this disease it's like oh gold silver lining um but and that was in 2016 it was stage one and over the years, I kind of had pain in my hips um, and started to get pain in my mid back. And so after having gone to a lot of people for physical therapy and trying to make it better and talk to my oncologist about it, I have a friend who's a um, urologist. And I said, hey, can you check and see if I have kidney stones? My back is really hurting. It, it was really physically limiting. <laughs> and so she did. And the scan showed that I had metastatic breast cancer in 2021. It was in um, my spine, my hip bones, and hundreds uncountable number of lesions in my liver so it not only spread to my bones but it spreads to my soft tissue so i had you know kind of some decisions to make because that's considered metastatic breast cancer at that point you're stage four and any care they give you is considered palliative instead of curative and i had to decide how i was going to live out my life so it's a little bit about my background Um, i work in the software industry i've had lots of different jobs with different people um um, 50, almost 55, almost double nickels. Wow. I have a, a very random question. Going back to the the plus on the surgery and getting new tatas, did yeah. you get to pick what size? I did. And, you know, I know that on podcasts you can't see me, <laughs> but I asked, I was kind of a C before, and I asked for a high C. Oh, not the drink, the, the, right. the, the cup size, <laughs> which, you know, if we think of a high C, let's think of a famous person. People might know that's a high C, probably Jennifer Lopez, high C, maybe. Um, so I wanted a high C and I was really excited because I nursed both my kids. And so after three solid years of nursing and pumping, because I worked, so and the pump's a little harsher on you than the actual child is, mm-hmm. um, they were saggy. You know, it's kind of like somebody put a rock in the bottom of an athletic sock. They were just low down. So <laughs> I was really excited about like, hey, this, this is, is hitting, silver lining. It's only close. stage one. I'm getting these new tatas. And so I picked a high C and holy Moses, they were bigger than Texas Whoa. when I came out. <laughs> Dr. Sherby, they would go down. And four months later, I'm like, what's going to add down? And she said, you must have really dense fat. And I don't know if that was a compliment or not, but... <laughs> They didn't really shrink, so you can get one adjustment done. So she adjusted them and said, I'm scared if I go too far, you'll be really small or they'll be kind of saggy because of how you do them. So let's just adjust them down a little. So now I'm like a double D, which is bigger than I expected. But you know what? I'm not complaining. They're perky. They're lovely. I have 
two of my four tattoos in my life are on them because I had to get the nipples tattooed. That was going to be my next question. People, was that your next question? It totally yeah, so they, was. They go in and they pinch this little piece of skin up and sew around it to make the nipple. And then you let that all heal. And then they tattoo them where like the outer part of the areola is a little lighter than the, the nipple itself. And so then you have like fully normal looking boobs. And initially I didn't think I cared about that. And then after like showering and stuff, it was weird to see these like alien boobs with no nipple and no areola. So I went for the tattoos. Yeah. That's like side note. One of my biggest fears is that I would go in and cause we had a little bit of a scare, but I was fine. And I was already doing the research thinking like, okay, we're going to hit this as aggressive as we possibly can. Saw that they could tattoo nipples that look beautiful. And I was like, well, shoot. All right, let's, uh, let's make this a plan. So my husband's from Wisconsin, Green Bay Packers fan, huge fan. I'm from Athens, Georgia. And so I'm a huge UGA fan. And um, the G's are actually the same G. The UGA coach actually at some point in time asked Green Bay if they could use it. I think they paid a dollar for the copyright laws. And so they both have the same G. So my husband really wanted me to get the Green Bay Packers G on one and the Georgia G on the other. And I said, dude, you're going to kick the bucket and I'll be with a Steelers fan. Like you want him to look at that all the time. So uh, we, we just decided for traditional nipples, but a lot of people, there are people who specialize in this lovely tattoo art that they do for people Mm -hmm. who've had um, singular or bilateral and either had a reconstruction or not to cover the scars. So, you know, if you're bored on a good day, Google that because there's just some amazing tattoo art that's done. Um, Dirty Skittles, that's another thing for you to go down the rabbit hole with on TikTok. I was going to do heart-shaped ones. Oh, there's like these floral, especially people who don't get reconstruction. So you just kind of have this um, horizontal scar across Mm -hmm. where your breast was. And they do like flowers and just all these just amazing things that I think mentally probably really help the folks who've lost a breast kind of adjust to it and learn to love their body again, even though it's different. So that's pretty cool to me. Yeah, it's beautiful. So how do you find your like zest for life? Because I I know that you have a couple of kids and, you know, um, you love to travel and drink and. I love to travel and drink and I love parties um until i'm done with them and then i just do the irish goodbye and split <laughs> um so you know i think for one year i'm on lifetime medic i had about um four months of chemo with that initial one and then like eight months in 2021 um and then i'm on medicine for the rest of my life and the medicine makes you really tired so there's definitely be a change um obviously i've had a liver with cancer in it and then i've also i had some um something called y90 radiation to my liver and that makes it a little bit you know, more. So I've had to cut back on the drinking for sure. Um, But, you know, you have a decision to make and and mentally it puts you in a really weird place because, you know, if they tell you, I think in March, they told March of 2021, they said, you know, on the outside, you have two years to live. And that was really, really hard because they thought, okay, I've got one daughter that's about to graduate. Another one's still in high school. Like, how do I want to manage this? And you go back and forth every day. I'm like, do I just want to party my ass off, eat everything in sight? Uh, can I say ass? I yeah. guess so. Yeah. Yeah. So We're like, you know, like you go time, back so. and like, if I've only got two years, I don't want to spend it eating like a rabbit and staying in my house and not doing anything. But then you also know that your odds of stretching it, that there, it's like all of life, right? There's some balance. So I just tried to, the first thing we did is get our legal crap in order. We had a will, but it had been made when the kids were really little. So really when they get older, it changes, right? Um, And then we also, and this is, you're going to think I'm crazy, but um, we also changed it so that if I die, it all goes into a trust and it's earmarked for certain things. But I did it, we did it, we did it in such a way, I guess when we did our first one, you know, you're optimistic. You don't think you're going to die before you're going to 60, 70 maybe even 80, 90. So we hadn't really thought about if one of us remarries. So I was like, you know what? If I die and I have life insurance, all this stuff, and my husband gets it and he remarries, what if he, you know, remarries somebody who's just in it to win it with the money and they divorce him and then they get half of his thing. So he redid it so that that can't happen. So that was like a little kind of, it's not that I don't, I would love for him to remarry if I die because he's a good husband and, and he enjoys uh, a partner. You know, he likes company and people to travel with. 
but I made sure that they couldn't take money that was rightfully my children's or whatever. So we, we did that first. So kind of once I got what I'm going to call the, I like a plan. I'm a numbers person. I like for it to add up. So, so I kind of immediately, maybe even before I started chemo, we went to see our financial planner and our lawyer and got everything in order. And then I decided that some of the things that maybe we plan to spend on money later, we do sooner because the girls, my children are old enough that they can, roll with us. You know, we can go to a foreign city and if they don't want to go, they're fine on their own. Um, so we, we've done a little bit more traveling. We went to Italy for a couple of weeks last year. The the kids only joined us for one week uh, because their school schedules. And um, we went to the beach for a week with my in-laws who I love. I had a lot of in-laws and um, my brother-in-law and his wife with none of our children. So that was fun. So just to, even though I had to work some while I was there, the other thing I did that's important for me is I kept working. Um, I think some people need a, you know, let their life is more like poetry. Like when they're sick, they want to curl up, they want to reflect, they want to do those things for me because I like a plan. If I had to stay, if it was in one of those countries where when you get sick, they make you take a certain amount of leave, I would lose my mind because I would just be going down the rabbit hole all day. So, um, so I think those are a couple of things I did, um, just accelerating some things. Interestingly enough, everybody's like, well, what's your bucket list? And by the way, it's been two years and three months. So I've outdone the life expectancy they gave me. And I feel great. I have no evidence of active disease. Um, the medication's working well. I feel extraordinarily, uh, blessed. And, but that goes back to the, then you have to live with boundaries because, you know, you want to live longer. Um, no, I just totally did had a had a moment. Um, mm. But well, anyway, uh, I don't have a bucket list. Was my little point there? All of a sudden, I realized that people who say, "Well, on my bucket list," once you kind of have this terminal or palette of diagnosis, you kind of realize the most important thing is spending time with friends and family. So T-Rex, when you came to town, like I was going to make time to visit with you because you never know. And we should really all live that way because when you realize that the bucket list isn't so much about much about the things you do, it's about the quality of the time you spend. And the people you spend it with. Yeah. And that, laughing a lot. That's so, so important. And laughing. Yeah. Levity is a lot of it. Like sometimes my kids, you know, will be like, hey, mom you don't need to come to this. I'm like, yeah, I do. I might not be here for the next one. And we just all laugh. Like we've, we've tried to really mix humor in there because if you don't, then it's just, I can suck the life out of you to, you know, kind of be obsessed with it. And I've also tried to volunteer for organizations where I can help others. Yeah. Cause I'm going to tell you that when I saw you, um, in oh, April ago? Yeah. in, uh, yeah, it was a month ago. Like that was the best time. We laughed and laughed and laughed and we ate and, and drank. And drank. <laughs> and somebody tried to drink me under the table, which they probably could have because by that time my liver was like done. <clears throat> and I was nursing a scraped up knee and a battered head. Okay. Yeah, that was and, your your uh multi state tour. Or... It was. And dirty skittles, I don't need to hear about the helmet. Okay? I was gonna say that's before she got the helmet. <laughs> Yeah. It, it was hot, okay? It's hot to wear the <laughs> helmet in Atlanta while you're drinking. And then how do you get past that, right? How do you get past the grill with the drink? A straw. Unless you have a straw. Okay, yeah. whatever. Look um, how quickly she had that solution. She has yeah. a plan for this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a couple questions. One of them, as you were talking and you were saying, you know, you had this will that you had to revise because more things were coming to to mind that you hadn't originally thought of was that you all on your own or was there anybody that was saying hey maybe think about this or did you find my, my husband and I talked about it okay so he and I kind of talked about it and um I have a, a really great financial planner um and she when we went to her and said you know We've been looking um, in our last meeting or whatever we talked about getting more life insurance once I hit the five-year mark from having the stage one cancer. And so we went to her and said, well, looking like we're not being able to get more life insurance, but you know, it's come back. What should we be doing? And she did start asking some questions about that. Okay. And then the other question um, that I thought of was how is it something that you and your husband had to sit down and discuss on how you were going to share that information with the rest of your family? 
where you hesitate? Uh, yeah. 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 Our financial planner and lawyer kind of facilitated some of that mm-hmm. um, because we changed how the minor children will be cared for. Gotcha. Um, we would want at this point they're in high school. We want them to stay in the house. We want somebody to come live in our house and get that. We don't want to change a lot. Right. If, if for some reason something happened to both of us. And so we had to get a lot of um, agreements signed by relatives that are involved in the whole management of the trust. Da, 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 and we just trust makes it sound so fancy. There's not like $10 million. There. <laughs> um, but so we had to engage them. So, you know, how we talked, were you asking how we talked to the family about the will or how we talked to the family about my illness? Uh, kind or, of both. I think we'd already talked to the family. We talked to them almost immediately. Um, I talked to my children have been through it once when they were younger. I think they were in maybe fifth and seventh grades. Yes, that's right. The first time I had cancer. Um, and so we talked about it a lot. Um, they were with me. I went to New York one time and I literally could not climb the stairs to go up in the Statue of Liberty because my pain was so bad, which we didn't know then it was cancer in my bones. And my doctor, my original oncologist, who I don't go to anymore, had said that it was, you know, because I was uh, older and a little overweight and some of the medicines medicines could cause joint pain. Um, Mm -hmm. I wish that here's my PSA. If you know your body and it hurts, go to a different doctor or literally ask for the scan. Like I never said, you know what? I get it. I'm 20 pounds overweight. I have had cancer. I'm on medications that make your bones hurt, but can you just scan me? I should have just asked for it um, because the cancer becomes more, more aggressive once it hits your soft tissue organs, like your liver. And if I could have stopped it while it was just expanded to my bones, it wouldn't have changed my stage four diagnosis, but it probably would have influenced my lifespan. Um, so it's, there's my PSA, it's done. But they've been with me through different times when I was like, I can't walk up this these stairs. And it, granted, it's, it's a lot of stairs, but I'd done it before, right? Like, so it wasn't right. something that physically I felt like I couldn't do. So um, we've always been really open with our kids. Not dramatic. Like I didn't give them the stats. They never knew. Uh, in 2021, they never knew the doctor had told my husband and I mm-hmm. um, that it was two year was, you know, the lifespan, because I didn't feel like that would help them in any way. So with all of our family, we, we told them, but really just felt like we told them what would help us. So, so gotcha. w- when you're traveling, like, do you, um, do you have to carry like a special medical card with you or anything? Or I do, I, do. I carry a, a medical card and I carry an armband because I have a, a portacath is what it's called. It's most people just refer to it as a port. It's in my chest, and that helps get medicines into me and helps get blood blood out of me. So I carry something about that. I carry my blood type in case. And the medicine makes you, well, for me at least, for a lot of people, the medicine I'm on, on it's it's a commercial brand called Ibrance. I don't Pacilip, I can't say the generic name for it, but. Um, you see the commercials on TV with people living a lovely life and drinking their tea in the garden, you know? Um, so that's the medication I'm on and actually it's working fantastically, but, um, it it makes you anemic. I'm anemic all the time. So I've had to get blood some. And so I carry stuff so that if any of that happens, they know. Um, but it, it, it really doesn't like if I went to the ER and, and passed out and, they didn't have it. It wouldn't change how they treated me. I don't think I did try to, I tried to, I tried to talk to um, the lady who did my plastic surgery for my new tatas mm-hmm. um, about getting an, uh, I have really bad eye bags. So I, I talked to her about maybe getting those removed. And because, you know, I'm like, yeah, it may only be another year, but it'll make me feel better. And she said, yeah, the, the risk of infection with your blood counts, like they stay just not worth it. Just live your life. Don't worry about the eye bags. And I was like, Oh, so it has kind of been disappointing a little bit because I can't get, <laughs> I can't get cosmetics. You know, a lot of doctors aren't going to touch you for cosmetic stuff because with your blood counts low and stuff like that, you're, you're considered immune suppressed basically. And so you can, hospital born illnesses and germs are going to affect you more. So maybe I'll just go to another plastic surgeon. I don't really like to get <laughs> my eyes idea. <laughs> <laughs> It was always on my list, you know, I, and so, yeah, uh, I, you know, 
I really like to get my eyes done. I've tried that tape stuff. So, so I'm just going to go ahead and tell you for me, that doesn't work. <laughs> and you see those infomercials, like when you're scrolling Instagram or whatever, and they show this little piece of tape you could put on your eyelid and it makes your oh, eyes yeah. look more open. Yeah. Yeah. Bought it. Didn't work for me. I'm sure it <laughs> works for some. I'm not going to say the infomercial is misleading, but yeah. And it also looks like you have a band-aid on your eyes. So I, I just gave up on that one. We'll keep working. <laughs> So, like, what are your travel plans for the next five years? Oh, uh, I don't really plan that far ahead, but but I wish I did. Um, and we're going, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to Edinburgh, actually for Christmas. So we have these really good friends, and they live out of state. It's my best friend since I was eight years old. She and her mm-hmm. husband, my husband and her husband get along great. And we just happen to have kids, literally the oldest are two weeks apart, girls, they're best friends. The youngest are three months apart, girls, they're best friends. Oh. And so we do a lot with them. We do a lot of vacations with them. They actually recently came to town. The girls all went to Taylor Swift. Oh, um, nice. But yeah, it was really nice. And so for Christmas, we got all four girls tickets to see Harry Styles at Sling Castle oh. in oh. Ireland. I'm so jealous. <laughs> yes. So we love Harry Styles. We've been to see him before. Um, the guys didn't go before. But so so then we decided that we'd tack a whole vacation on that. So for our family, my little four-person family, is going to Edinburgh for a few days. And then we're all meeting in Dublin, sharing a big house, and just kind of doing that and so then we started talking on other things like a friend of mine who lives in the uk and her husband are going to meet us in edinburgh and a friend of ours from the u.s that we grew up with but lives on the west coast now she's going to come in and they're going to be in dublin for three days and galway which we're doing a day trip to for one day so we're going to get to see them so it, hey if anybody's listening and you know who bookie is <laughs> come on meet us just join us we're just having a big old party across the <laughs> pond so yeah, we're excited. So we're doing that. Um, we're going to our family re- reunion, which is at the beach, a, a, a random beach in North Carolina, because it's midway between all the family. Uh, I think that's as far as we've gotten, T Rex. You got any suggestions after your global travels? Um, if you get a chance, I would certainly uh, tackle uh, Greece. I would do Santorini. Um, only if you're like strong enough to do a lot of walking. Um, one of the oh, yeah, one totally. Of, one of the problems with being in Santorini, especially up near uh, OA, is that a lot of the taxi drivers and private drivers can't drive right in, so you have to do a lot of walking. So if you're not really stable on your legs or you no no, do I'm a lot totally. Of walking, he walked with me. I'm totally. Actually, I actually have so much less pain now than I did two years ago. Right. That's like, awesome. yeah, I do have some neuropathy in my feet, but it's so much easier than it was when I didn't know I had cancer and I had cancer all through my hips and spine. It really affects your ability to walk long distances and in particular climb. So we went to, we went to uh, Greece in Santorini uh, 20 years ago for our honeymoon. Oh. It's fantastic. Yeah, I would definitely do the Greek islands again. Um, if I was to do it again, though, I would do like one of the small cruise ships that goes to each of the different islands. Um, to me, that would, would have been a better place. And then um, my other most favorite place was um, outside of Paris in the Champagne region, um, Epernay. Will you email me how to Freaking spell that? Beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. And, uh, you know, just doing a lot of the Mon Pa small champagne houses, um, it, it's amazing. Yeah, we've never been there, so that would be really cool. I'm going to put it on my list. So you can actually take a train from Paris to Epernay. It's about an hour. It's a fast train and beautiful countryside, um, beautiful people. Once you get outside of Paris, you miss all that rudeness of people. So if you get out into like the countryside, and Epernay and Reims and that whole area, um, I, I would... I would definitely do it. So like for us, we're actually going to do next year. We're going to go back. We're going to do Epernay, Reims, and then go back down into Florence. Yeah. Wouldn't Um, you say like, I think about like people have these big houses and they're driving Mercedes and stuff like that, but they're totally at their like last dollar every month. Get a smaller house, get cheaper cars and travel. Like there is nothing like experiences in my opinion. Yeah, because you can take that with you, right? Like it's, it's always there. Memories and and the pictures that I was able to get. And when I I I talk to you and I hear your travels, and you know I get a little jealous, right? Um, but like you're out there just living your life every single day, 
And yes, you have a terminal in- illness, but you make me laugh every time I talk to you. <laughs> and your travels are amazing. And you're always giving me really good financial number <laughs> advice. So um, like Bookie is is the deal, man. She's the real deal. She's you're, you're just a good person and you have such a big heart. I mean, you're for sure inspiring me. I am one of those people that don't really travel or have the experiences because I get so anxious. I'm like, oh, but I will say now that I've found our passports because we lost them for a minute, but we found them. They're still good. (laughs) We are looking at going to Greece and actually having a life experience and not letting the anxiety hold me down. It's funny because with Edinburgh, I, I texted a girlfriend who went a few years ago and she said, you know, we were supposed to go to Edinburgh and I can't remember where else they were going. And she goes, and we liked it so much. We just canceled the rest of our plans and stayed there. And being a somewhat anxious person myself, I thought, huh. But then I thought, you know what? That's right. If you get somewhere you like, stay there an extra week and cancel the rest of it and, you know, go back. Like there is like, I think we all tend to just try to over plan everything. And you can do a little bit of flexibility, you know. I think that, or if you go somewhere and you don't love it, like if we go to Edinburgh, we're there for four or five days, we hate it. We can go on and go to Dublin and we'll just stay in a chintzy hotel until our Airbnb becomes available. Um, so yeah, let the anxiety go on that one. Just flow with it. I'm trying I, I, every I just, day. <laughs> I, I, I love your outlook on life. Like we can all learn like such important lessons from you, Bookie. And I think we can all learn lessons from each other. Like that's the beautiful thing about making friends and going places and meeting new people and all the, it's an experience. You learn from experience, right? You know, and I think levativity also helps so much. Like it, it has so much healing power to it. Being able to laugh about shit that we shouldn't laugh about. But for me, it, it it's healing for me. Right. And I think it's healing for other people. Like we, we laugh about stuff we shouldn't laugh about, <laughs> but it's not to make fun of it. It's just to lighten, lighten the load and, you know, kind of clear people's heads out of whatever shit's going on. Well, and I think it helps you realize like, cause a lot of it's like self-deprecating laughter, right? Like we're mm-hmm. laughing at ourselves, but it also helps you make realize that everybody's just human. Like we're all doing it right sometimes, wrong sometimes. And if we can't laugh at it, that's just got to be a terrible, I, like I think about, I have a friend who's, who is somewhat bitter a lot. Um, it's actually a relative. And I've always just thought, how do they live that way? Like, it must be heavy. Like I would, I, I'm lucky that everybody in my world likes humor because I think it'd be a miserable place if we just had to all be bitter all the time about things yeah. you can't control or mistakes you made or whatever. There's no bitterness here. We we yeah. laugh. We laugh a lot. Me and well, Marie except Skittles. for in the old fashioned. I'll take bitters in my old fashioned. That's it. <laughs> yeah. So very true. Very true. I had the best old fashioned when I was in um Florence. They I think had, you like Instagrammed it or something because I was a little jealous. They had <laughs> C B D bitters in there. It oh. was amazing. Like so the best like... old fashioned I ever had. Tipsy and relaxed all at once. Like yeah, how tipsy and work? relaxed all at the same time. That was the same night that I got the really good picture of the moon. Oh, the yeah, arch, yeah, yeah. Which was a, a total fluke. But, yeah, you know, I, I, I just love your outlook on life. You you Thank make you. me want to live my life better and, you know, take away my boundaries and just be a, a good person. I, mean, I think for the most I have part, I am a that. good person. Fairness. It's not all, you know, unicorns and rainbows. I have my days where I get really depressed about it. Like, or, you know, I'll just be like this, you know, I'll say something to my kids. Like, well, when you have kids, dad and I will be there all the time to take care of them. And then I'm like, in my head, you know, there's that little voice that says, Lily, Lily, statistically, that's not true. Did you just tell a lie to your children? Because I've always been really big about being honest. So, so I think it's also within people's rights to have have their we all have our good days and our bad days and i think that you know sometimes you you go down that you just have to figure out that things are good in general you know like i i just have to go back to and and plus i'm a little bit lazy i'm too like anger takes so much energy (laughs) but i just don't have a lot of inner like i'm just too lazy for that like it's like "Ah, i could be mad at them but really what's that gonna do you know so when you get depressed just give me a call 
because, you know, I'm not really going back to work. Well, we're not going to even call it work anymore. We're going to call it knowledge transfer. When I go back in middle of July, I have 10 weeks. Give me a call. I'll make you laugh. I have my cell phone with me every day. And it's cheaper than my therapist. (laughs) (laughs) I might be a tiny bit of reverent. (laughs) <laughs> because according to my wife, I'm a tiny bit irreverent lately. So yeah. there you go. that kind of ties into what I was going to ask. My last question was going to be if this has always been your outlook on life or did you get help finding this way of life? You know, they say the older you are, the wiser you are. Mm-hmm. Um, I even think about this with like somebody I was I was in uh, one of my company's offices this week and I was driving a a rental car and I had folks following me because they didn't know where they were going and somebody jetted around me on the right hand side without a lane there it was just like her and they were like street racing and I thought boy I remember when I thought that I was invincible like you know or when I you know did dumb young stuff right like And so I think some of it's just wisdom. You realize it's not worth the energy to be angry or jealous or like, so some of it's just wisdom and some of it's therapy. Like, you know, you, you find a good therapist and you talk through and they help you, you realize that. Um, But I also have this, my mom was a single mom. My dad passed away when I was really small, like three. And she could have immediately like got off, tried to get another husband, whatever. Instead, she went back to school. She got her degree. She got a degree in education so she could be home when we were home. Um, And so she's always kind of been this inspirational person and that she laughed at things. She was really real about things and she never um, put her family second. So I think that part of it comes from that. And by family, I mean that extension beyond actual blood relatives, you know, her team, her people, her uh, squad. What are you, what is it called these days? The kids always always call it something different. But so I think that's you know I had I've been very fortunate to grow around, up around um, a lot of great people and to work with a lot of great people. That's awesome. I've so never I, worried about the neighborhood. I've always just worried about the neighbors. That's how I call it. I love that. So I have one last question for you. If sure. you if you had like a quote for your life now, what would it be? Remember, I told you I'm good at numbers. Can I give you an equation? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I don't know. Uh, Don't procrastinate probably is the biggest in all things. Like usually if you just get it done, regardless of what it is, you're going to feel so much better. Just kind of like go with it. (laughs) Go with it. Yeah. Don't procrastinate. Get it done. And even the hard things, the things you don't want to do, like that whole like thinking about what we all think having to have that discussion. Once it was done, I felt so much better because I felt like things were in order. I could just go out and live my life. And if something happened, because we, like I said, we hadn't revisited it for like 15 years. Like we went from having babies when we wrote it to having big kids. And you should really be doing that anyway, because if you know that's in order, you just don't feel so chaotic. Just don't, don't procrastinate and, and go out and live and do things and, um, think about the neighbors, not the neighborhood. So you're spending your money on the right things. Experience is my huge thing. So I don't have a quote (laughs) is the answer. (laughs) It's okay to be not okay. Just make sure you're talking to someone.